This is the OTP presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. Plan on paying less for the coverage you need with Farm Bureau Health Plans. Get a quote today at FBHP.com. My name is Mike Keith, and this is Amy Wells, and we're actually together. We are in actually the together. MGM Studio. It feels good. It's good to have you back. You're technically in the Snickers hot seat, but not really. because you, Oh, no, I'll take it, though. But you're the co-host, so you can't be... I can't be in the hot seat, I suppose. No. I, th- I mean, I guess I could be. Um, the jar's a little far, but I'll find a time to get a Snickers. There you go. Throughout the program. Really satisfies. It really does. That's what I've heard. <laughs> so, uh, last week was quite the adventure for the Tennessee Titans and uh, the Titans staff and Titans fans, uh, for, for that matter. Uh, the week began with the Titans doing a couple of interviews, and the second one was Brian Callahan. Brian Callahan was in in the afternoon, and in the one of 64 Brian Callahan interviews that has been done <laughs> since that time, you have probably heard the story that he he walks in to the head coach's office and sits behind the desk to see what it's like, and they offer him the job, and he's very excited and uh, it's it's really a cool story, but kind of leading from there, it got interesting, and that's what we want to take you through on this edition of the OTP. Pull back the curtain just a little bit and take you through what went next, because this lady, Amy Wells, Ashley Farrell, a couple other members of our staff, uh, Donald Page and Todd Gray, made a trip that you're probably just now becoming aware of that added sort of a special element, an extra special element, if you will, to the Brian Callahan piece. So Monday night, the word gets out, Brian Callahan is going to be the coach. The Titans have offered him the job. He's accepted. Now all the things have to happen settling on a contract. And that's why the Titans don't release it Because while it's reported, and nobody's denying it, which is always your hint. If people start denying it, then it's not true. But (laughs) if if the media is reporting it, if several sources are reporting it, it's out there. But what you're learning from the time in between the report and the time in between the release is there are a lot of things that have to happen. Right, and that's standard practice. I mean, the Tennessee Titans always operate in that fashion and most organizations operate in that fashion where it might be out there but until things are signed sealed and delivered unless Jim Irsay is your owner because he would not all teams operate in this manner (laughs) he would normally tweet out (laughs) he he likes to be on the on the very 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 beginning of breaking news he likes to break the news yes but a lot of organizations operate in the manner where it's until the ink is dried on paper we are not going to confirm anything because in keeping with <laughs> the Colts theme, they got in a situation a couple years ago where Josh McDaniel. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, it was mostly done, but it wasn't completely done. And then some things got hairy on the back end. So you want to be sure, sure. And we do this in a lot of different ways with player acquisitions, sure. with a free agency. And there's all kinds of things where you hear about it, you see it, but it's not done, done, done. Cause there's so many things that have to happen. Well, and we, talk about this on the OTP and the OT people know if, if you've listened for a long time you understand what we're really discussing here and that is that okay it, it, the, he's got an agent mm-hmm. Brian Callahan has an agent and the agent hasn't said yes yet so you've got to work that out what are going to be the details Here's the other part of it. You got to call home, right? You've got to I mean, notify gotta, the family. You, gotta, you, you <laughs> got probably, a job. You probably want to tell your wife. Mm-hmm. I accepted the job with the Titans in 1998 before I had consulted with my wife. You it, did that? It was a huge mistake. Mike, let me, that's let me just, bold. It was not bold. It was it was very stupid. <laughs> it was really a dumb move. You really did that? I really did that. Whoa. I really did that. And the worst (laughs) part was I didn't have a cell phone. Can't tell her until you get home. No, I had to pull off and use a pay phone in Crossville. So (laughs) fortunately, Brian Callahan's a lot smarter than me. 
he called home and just made sure that. I can't believe you did that. I know. <laughs> yeah. So Brian Callahan wins in that regard. Oh, he really did. He told his wife. But he you, told his parents. But you do that. You, you, yeah. You've got some calls to make. You're certainly going to call the Bengals if you're him. You want to call Zach Taylor and let him know what's going on so he can put things in place. You're going to call, I would imagine, the Brown family who owns the Bengals and just to let them know out of respect. So there are all these boxes that have to be ticked off. Well, Amy and Ashley had come up with this great plan to do a story, and it was to go with the new Titans head coach back to where they were from Mm -hmm. and to do kind of the story coming out of where they were from as they make the trip to Nashville. Now, it worked particularly well because Cincinnati is not that far away. It's not at all. It's a very easy drive. It's quite lovely. If if the Titans had hired a coach from, say, Seattle, might not have been doable. But so Tuesday, you're just waiting on official word so you can leave for Cincinnati. Yep. we. What time were you prepared to leave? I was ready to leave at 9 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Ashley got the rental car at 7? Yeah, Ashley got the rental car at 7 a.m. So you're ready. I was ready to go. They were going to swing by my house and pick me up on the way out of town. Nine o'clock, my bag's by the front door. I'm waiting. I'm ready to go. But we hadn't gotten word yet. There's no there's no official announcement at that. No point. official announcement. Not that there's anything wrong. It's <laughs> just it we hadn't it's, gotten the go yet. We needed a green light. Yeah. That's all we needed. And uh, so we waited. And then it seemed like, well, it might be a little while. There's still some stuff going on. So I throw my bag in the trunk, get all of my things. I'll just leave from the office. That's fine. So, so you I come, come into work. You come to Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park. Yep, I do. And uh, sit down at my desk. Don't even really get my computer out for a while because I think I'm just here for a minute. And we wait. <laughs> and we wait. And we wait. And we wait some more. So it's 5 o'clock. <laughs> and I've had a conversation with Amy. I'm actually technically on vacation. Yeah. Well, not technically. No, you were actually on vacation. On vacation. Yeah. Um, And so I get notifications shortly after five that the Titans are going to make the announcement at 9.15 Central on Wednesday. And I relay this immediately to Amy, and you are standing where when I called you? At 5.11 p.m., (laughs) I get notification from Mike Keith as I am putting my hand on the handle of my car in the parking lot to go home. I was going to go home. You're in the parking garage. You just figure this is – Try again tomorrow. We'll try again tomorrow. They're figuring everything out. I am getting ready to go home. He, I got a text message from you, Mike, Mm -hmm. that said, we're a go. And I just turned around and walked back in the building. (laughs) Like, okay, now what do we do? So at that point, we kind of huddled the group together, had a conversation about what we were going to do, what the new plan was, what our new timeline was going to be. And then we left the next morning. And I went in Charleston, South Carolina and got a rental car. You did. And Mike got a rental car and hit the road. Hit the Came road. back home. Well, <laughs> hit the road the next morning, as did you guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't have to leave so early. No, we didn't. And you, so, so Brian Callahan and Allison Callahan, his wife, say, yeah, we'll do this feature. And the plan is to do it at their home. Yes. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to document what is – a historic event for any organization, the hiring of a new head coach. And we wanted to do the best that we could to introduce this person in a very different way. You don't usually have the opportunity to see a head coach outside of the facility. Sure. It's just in general. Um, You get to know them over the years. You get to know their personalities, that kind of thing. But you don't get to see much of their lives outside of football. And so we wanted to start off right from the jump, really get to know this person, and get to know this person in a way where they're really comfortable, and that's around their family in their home. Um, that, That felt like the best way to get to know him. That felt like a good way to kind of get things started off. And he was gracious enough to allow us to do that all right so you get in the van you drive from nashville to cincinnati does he actually live in cincinnati he lives in cincinnati okay yes so not like florence kentucky or wherever he's in no he lives about five minutes from the Bengals stadium okay so you drive up to his house Mm -hmm. 
He answers the door. Brian Callahan answers the door. He answers the door. We walk up to his house. There's four of us, so we troop up the front stairs. Now he knows you're coming, which he is knows, good. He mm-hmm. knows that we're coming. I had text with him back and forth, um, but I've never met this person. Sure. And um, <laughs> we get to the front door, and what strikes me, which is so strange because he's in his own house, but my first thought was he's not wearing any shoes. I've never seen a head coach not wearing shoes before. But, I mean, he's at home. A lot of people don't wear shoes in their own house. Well, but sure, it, yeah. it just felt – in that moment, I realized, like, oh, we're actually going to pull this off. This is going to be a casual, comfortable thing. He's not even wearing shoes. I don't know why that's a thing that stuck in my head, but it, it felt very intimate somehow. You know, it felt very personal. You don't see very many people without – I've never seen you without shoes on. Like, it's just a way you don't see people outside of work. I guess that's true. Yeah. It, it's. It, I hadn't thought about that. For whatever reason, it just – Oh, he is in his house. He's not even wearing shoes. So uh, that struck me. But he was very kind, greeted everybody, invited us in. You know what the first thing he did was? No. He offered us sandwiches. What kind of sandwiches? I don't know. I never had a sandwich. You um, didn't accept a sandwich from the new head coach? You know, it was one of those things where it was like, you know, we're good right now. Let's get our stuff down, unload the car and everything. And then I never circled back to the sandwiches. But You didn't want a sandwich? <clears throat> Not at that moment. I mean, My don't guy you had think? Some it, other stuff going I mean, now on. thinking back about it, and I think the OT people might agree. I, I think it's rude that you didn't accept a sandwich. You know, honestly, when I left, I was thinking that because if I had food and beverages for people who were coming into my home and no one accepted them, and then I had just like four sandwiches sitting in my house, I'd be annoyed. So, Coach Callahan, I apologize. Mm-hmm. I didn't take a sandwich. I'll take one now, but. It was another one of those gestures that was just, welcome to my home. Can we feed you? That is so nice. It was very nice. It was incredibly hospitable. He's going to fit right in in the South. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the most Southern gesture to offer someone a sandwich. But really, it it was just another moment where I was like, oh, this is... uh, this is really like how he is as a person. In his home, he offers you food and drink. So Allison is his wife. Yes. She's originally from New Jersey. She is. She lived in Denver. Yeah. Um, what was she like? She's delightful. Um, they have two young kids. And so she is a mom who is keeping up with two young kids and is so excited for her husband. Um, and was just the most delightful person. She was incredibly accommodating of the things that we would need. I mean, we basically walked into their home and we're like, can we rearrange some of this furniture? <laughs> like, Because you're trying to get a shot. So what room were you in? We were in the living room. Living room? Um, How would you say the house is decorated? Beautifully. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean yeah, I would, I would think uh, yeah. you would say that, but do you have a style? I don't know the words. Like a modern I don't watch as much farmhouse. HGTV as you do. It was nice. The couch was white. It was nice. I don't know. Boy, now that's gutsy to I have a white couch. With kids? Especially with a six-year-old boy. Uh, yeah. Uh, as someone who just unloaded a white couch because kids, uh, I mean, proud of them. Yeah. Like, that's incredible. That's strong play. Yeah, it really is a strong play. They're really good parents if they can keep a couch that mm-hmm. look nice like that. Um, but, uh, I mean, really, they were super hospitable. Come in. What can we do? How do we make this shot work? Can I move this plant across the room for you? What if we move these six chairs to a different location? Like, the most accommodating So you're in the new Titans head coach's house in Cincinnati. Rearranging his furniture, yeah. Rearranging Mm -hmm. his furniture. He's (laughs) offered you a sandwich. Mm -hmm. And so what would you say? We're going to play the interview. Oh, of course. We're going to let the OT people Mm -hmm. hear this interview that no one else has. Mm -hmm. Because it was in Cincinnati at yeah. his home. It was, and they gave, showed us around. Um, he showed us some of the memorabilia that he has throughout his house. I mean, it, how many uh, pictures of Peyton Manning? None, maybe one, maybe one, but it wasn't overly. Pay- There's probably more pay- pictures of Peyton Manning in your house than his. I don't. I don't think I have. I mean, I have a couple of autographs. Yeah, he signed a couple of footballs that. That I have very nice. You don't have any pictures of Peyton Manning Do in your house. Do I have any pictures? I don't know that I have any pictures of any athletes in my house. That's surprising to me. I have, I have things. Yeah. Most of my, I mean, mementos. Well, ninety percent of the stuff out in my house is Titans, uh, football, 
Uh, the racing helmet I got to wear that Mario Andretti signed. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's that's great. A cool it's my thing. favorite piece of memorabilia. Yeah. Outside of my football that every first round pick as a Titan has signed. Oh, yeah. That's Except, a cool you know thing who too. didn't? The only one, Pac Man Jones. He didn't sign it? He did not. So I never had a chance to, to get him to sign it. Oh, that's disappointing. I think I'm going to have to rectify that at some point. Speaking of Cincinnati, I think at some point I'm going to have to rectify that. Yeah. But, I no, I don't think I have any pictures of, of anybody. Huh. That's surprising to me. Maybe Dyson scoring on the Music City Miracle? Yeah. That would make I'm gonna sense. I'm going to have to look around my house. Yeah. Maybe I should go there. Just go home and <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> just survey. Yeah, I <laughs> survey the walls. See what you got. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, and his house was not. But does not, he have like a, it was a man not, cave? So, no. Okay. He has kind of an a, like a rec room area okay. where they had some different things. And it was one of those like rooms we thought we'd use more than we do uh, like everyone has right. in their home yeah um like the aspirational entertaining room that you really never use and right. just put stuff in that's kind of what they have um they're just like real people they are 100 percent regular p- normal people and that's what i walked away from this whole experience with i mean there's a million stories i could tell but what really struck me is you are like i, f- I felt very comfortable there I felt very like these people could be friends of mine. The uh, we have a lot in common. Yeah, you could go he to church his, with them. You could. Uh, yeah. you, they could be friends of uh, yours from your kids' school. That that yeah, sort of thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, very much. We're talking about like kids' clothes that he left in the middle of the interview because he had to go take his son to get a haircut. He was gone for about forty-five minutes. So is that before or after the interview? Uh, before the interview, okay. he left. He welcomed us into his home. We were there for a while, and then he looks at his watch and goes, I got to take Ronan to get his haircut. That's his son, Ronan. And um, Ronan, who, who stole the show at R- the press conference. Ronan is going to be a fan favorite. Yeah, he's going to be a mainstay around Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park, I believe. Um, and Nora as well, their daughter. Yes. Um, but both, I mean, just the the most delightful children. And um, But yeah, Ronan needed to get a hair, his haircut, so... Um, Head ball coach leaves for okay, about so, 45 to an hour. So you sit down to do the interview. Yes. Which we're going to hear. I'm, this is the back cell. you got to love this. I'm setting it up. Are, I, you, are you nervous? You know, I was not because I felt incredibly comfortable in that space. Did you write down the questions? I did. Um, I had about four pages of questions. So we had to... I had to rein in my excitement a little bit. I have my questions, you know, for a standard interview. I've got my notebook. I'm ready to go. But it, we had been talking this whole time and having conversation, so it didn't feel weird to be doing an interview. And honestly, I was thankful for it because, you know, there's those questions that you want to ask somebody, but you want to be polite. and be sure. like, Well, surely they don't want to talk about football, so I'm not going to ask him. Uh, you know, about putting together a staff or this and that. But for an interview, I'm able to ask those questions. So it was it was things that in polite conversation I probably wouldn't have asked. But because I was doing an interview for a football team and this is what's top of his mind, I got to ask those questions that I think people want to know. But if you and I just meet at a party, I'm not going to ask you too many questions about your job because that's not what we're – what right. we're doing, you know? I get that. So it, I was thankful to have the opportunity to do the interview because I got to ask him the things that were on my mind. And it's like, oh, I'm sorry, I have to. It's for my job, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I uh, was great. Use that as your excuse. Uh, I always do. And he was just, it was a great interview. He is, he's just very well spoken. He's very thoughtful with the things that he is trying to get across. You can tell that this is something he's been thinking about for a long time. He's one of those people that, you know, as he's been doing his job, he's been observing and thinking about how he'd do it when he got his chance. And now that he has his chance, this is something he takes very seriously and is very excited about and is is really, really ready for. All right. We're ready for the interview. But first, we have to make sure and give everyone a chance to get Duncan. Go to Duncan and grab a coffee and kick off the action, whether that's drinking a cup of coffee on your way to the game or grabbing one to go before watching Amy's interview with Brian Callahan. Duncan is always there to help you get your game on. Just like the pros, we need to be at our best come game time or interview time. 
which is why Duncan is the most important part of your game day ritual because it's always the best call for football. America runs on Duncan. So from the OTP, Amy Wells, Cincinnati, Ohio, at the home of new Titans coach Brian Callahan, enjoy this. So I guess the best place to start is telling you, or reminding you, I should say, that you are the head coach of an NFL football team. <laughs> it doesn't feel real yet. Right? And it doesn't. That's the question. Has this yeah. sunk in that the last 24-ish hours have actually happened and you are now stepping into this role? No, I haven't been able to process it all. It's been such a, you know, because I went in, I interviewed, and then I get the job, and I go to dinner, and I wake up the next morning, and I leave, and I come home, and then there's just like this 48-hour period where I got to get a bunch of stuff ready to to really get to work when I get back and do the press conference, and um, you're starting the staff hiring process. It's very, it's like infancy stages, but it's starting, um, and so it's just a, it's a whirlwind of things that I probably won't ever fully process it until I'm, I'm in front of the team that first time or the first OTA practice where you're, it's like you're out there and, and you're on the grass coaching football. The, the rest of it up until that point feels very much like office work until you get to go coach football again. So yeah, I, don't, I have not been able to really process all of it. And the fact that we're in my living room with a camera talking about it just feels even stranger. It definitely is, I'm sure, a whirlwind, and there's not a moment to catch your breath and really think about it until you're reflecting on it. Mm -hmm. um, so in the spirit of reflecting, because you don't have time to reflect on this, let's reflect on your entire career. Sure, I can do that. <laughs> you have really started your career from, in coaching, I should say, from high school, mm -hmm. coaching high school players you've gone all the way up, you've seen every facet of this game, and now you're finally here where you wanted to be as a head coach. At what point in your career did you think, I could go all the way with this, I could be an NFL head coach? You know, I had a good example. Uh, my dad was one, so uh, just like anything, you see that it's possible, um, and I was able to envision that for myself at some point. I didn't probably really want to go down that path until uh, after I was a graduate assistant at UCLA, I, I was, wasn't sure which direction I wanted to head. I wanted to be in athletics. I enjoyed being around football. And I didn't know which, what that was going to look like for me. And so uh, eventually I went to go do the high school. That I coached high school for two years. And that part really was enjoyable. And it made me want to continue to do that. Uh, and then I just, the opportunity came to get in the NFL two years after I started. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll see where this takes me. Um, but I was uncertain of what that was going to look like when I was first starting out um, and then once I got in the NFL I, I felt like you know I could I could do this I could I could end up in this seat that I'm in right now uh, coaching is not the most glamorous of jobs once you get to the head role it looks very glamorous but football families especially you mentioned that your dad was a coach still is a mm -hmm. coach football families sometimes do not um, romanticize the the sport as much because it's taxing on the whole family. Yes. It, it, did that influence your career choice at all? That you've seen how this really works? I, I just knew what I was entering into. Um, and when I when I first told my, my mom that I wanted to coach football after I was uh, finished playing, I was gonna be a graduate assistant and that went two years and I said, you know, I think I wanna do this for real. And she wasn't very happy with me. Um, she's like, you got, you have two degrees from UCLA, you can go do whatever you want why would you do this? And um, I don't know. I just love doing it. But uh, her point was there's so many other things you could do. Why would you choose to enter this volatile of a profession? And um, I just love being around football and being around players. And that part is what I, that's what I enjoy about it. The rest of it is the work part, you know, um, all the, the, the time and effort. Uh, it's a ton of work. There's really no shortcuts. And if you don't do that part, you're gonna have a hard time being successful. And so there's a lot of sacrifice that gets made, but uh, ultimately it's, you know, I, I have a great wife and great family that, that helps the process move smoothly, but I wouldn't say that uh, there's a lot of glamor involved in it for the most part. It's, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice, um, just like any jobs uh, where, you're, where you're trying to, to do something really cool and, and do something collectively that we're trying to do with the Titans and there's no other way I'd know how to do it, but it is not the easiest and it is not glamorous, I can promise. You've had the opportunity to work in a lot of different places with a mm -hmm. lot of different people. Um, 
Have you given any thought to what your head coaching style is going to be like? What pieces and bits you're going to grab from each place and kind of put together to create what yeah. will be the Coach Callahan way? I think that's where I am now. I, I feel like I've been very prepared for this uh, moment. Um, there's a lot of people that have that invested a lot in me over my, over the years, and because of that, I've probably taken bits and pieces of them throughout without even really thinking about it. Just things that I've liked. Um, but I think what you see now is what you're going to get. Um, I'm not going to really try to be anybody else but but me, and um, I feel really confident in that. I feel good about where I am and who I am, and so um, that part feels really easy for me. And um, I'm pretty genuine and pretty authentic, and. Um, that that's not going to change. You're going to you're going to get that every day from me here. So uh, I don't know that there's any other. You know, the influences are, are probably more in the work uh, as opposed to the personality. And I think I'm I'm going to be 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 me. It's the best I can explain it. Having worked your way up through the NFL, you haven't taken any shortcuts. You haven't done anything the easy way, the quote unquote easy way. Yeah. Um, do you think that makes you uniquely qualified for a role like this? Uh, I feel qualified for it um, because of that. I don't know if, if anybody else feels that way or not, but um, I do think there is something to be said for for taking the those steps in the journey. And um, the journey is certainly not over yet for me. But doing those things in in the matter in the in the sequence that they've happened for me, I think, has prepared me to be here. I feel like I've earned my way here. Um, and, I, and I'm proud of the work I've done and all the places I've been, but there's no point where I've ever felt like it was easy. Um, but it but it matters to me and I'm proud of that. And, and I think I'm here today because of that journey I've had thus far. What do you learn from being a high school football coach? Yeah, there's a lot you learn from being a high school football coach. In particular, I was a I was the freshman offensive coordinator. So I get, uh, I get, I call um, Patrick Walsh as a head coach at Sarah High School, and he's one of my mentors. He coached me at De La Salle High School when I was in high school, and uh, he'll be at the press conference too, by the way, which will be cool. Um, he said, I got a job for you. And I said, I, I need a teaching job. I can't just coach football. I need, to, I need to work at the school. I have my master's in education. Like, it fits. This will be great. So I get a job at the school, and he says, well, only job I have for you coaching is the freshman offensive coordinator. Uh, and after playing Division One football and being a graduate assistant, that was a little bit of a humbling offer. That was the only offer I had was to go be the freshman football coach. And uh, when you get a bunch of 14-year-olds that probably have never put shoulder pads on, don't know how to buckle their helmet, uh, it really makes you refine how you teach and how you communicate with how your kids, how clearly you tell them what to do. And so it really changed the whole foundation of what I what coaching is for me, and it's it really brought it back to, it's about teaching. It's how you teach, uh, and that hasn't changed in, in 14 years in the NFL and at all the stops I've been. The, the best coaches I've been around are great teachers, um, and that was probably the most uh, foundational and influential part of my early journey was coaching a bunch of 14-year-olds and trying to get them to get in a three-point stance and know how to get an athletic stance in general and, and how to communicate that, and so um, that part was really, invaluable experience for me as a as a really young coach like I don't know everything and I better figure out how to talk to these guys or they're not gonna know anything either and so uh, it was it was a huge part of my journey it has to be if you can get a 14 year old to run a play mm -hmm. you can probably communicate with a professional athlete how to maybe do it at a higher level yeah and that's the that's always gonna be the key to all of it is, is how well do you communicate uh, individually how well do you communicate as a, as a leader of a unit, and how well do I communicate as the head coach with everybody in the building, everybody on the team? Um, and you refine those communication st styles and um, techniques with your teaching as well. And so when you, when you communicate well, you, you're a good teacher. I think everybody would, would think back to whatever teacher they had that, they, that made an impact on them, and it's because they were probably great communicators at what they were looking for. Um, and so I, I pride myself on that, and it's, you know, if you can again get a, if you can get a fourteen year old to do it, you certainly could get uh, a professional athlete that's paid a lot of money to, to do that job. As a coach, you obviously you've been a quarterbacks coach, you've been an offensive coordinator, and you've had the opportunity to work with some pretty incredible quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of across the spectrum, you've been in some different situations. Um, working with someone like Peyton Manning, so mm -hmm. by the time you get to him, he's pretty much got his routine set. I mean, yes. 
Peyton Manning knows what he wants to do by the time he comes to the Denver Broncos. What did you learn from working with a player like that? Well, that was a unique situation because he was coming from a place he had been for, for 15 years in Indianapolis. He had run a variation of the same offense for most of that time. So he was in transition. He was learning some of what uh, the, the things that we did in Denver, and we were trying to learn some things that he did. We were trying to m meld the system of offense to one that was what we did and what he did and to make it our system in Denver. And that was unique because he had never had to do that before. Everything was always how he had done it. Um, and so we, we worked really hard to, to meld the systems. But when you talk about learning from a guy like Peyton, uh, outside of helping a transition was the preparation part, how intense it was. Um, it was more me learning what a Hall of Fame quarterback looks like, what, a, what their process looks like, what their preparation on a weekly basis uh, is supposed to be. Um, and that's, that's, it was like a PhD in quarterback play. And uh, that part was the most probably most foundational piece of what I've done since then is all those things I learned uh, with Peyton in those four years in Denver. And it was, uh, it was a lot of fun every day to go to work. It was hard and he demanded a lot, but um, it made me a really good coach. Uh, and I learned a, a whole lot about how, what it looks like to play NFL quarterback at a high level. Um, and I think I've hopefully used those things to help a lot of guys along the way. Um, I want to fast forward a little bit. You've worked with a lot of great quarterbacks, but Joe Burrow is a name mm -hmm. that everyone knows right now and um, a very different situation to where he's a young guy who's trying to learn how to exist in what is the National Football League. Mm -hmm. um, do you have to resist taking some of that and overwhelming him? Do you almost have to back off a little bit? How do you manage that because it's such a different situation completely on the opposite side of the spectrum? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question because, you know, you have a guy in Peyton that, that knows what he wants, how he wants it, and there's not, there's only a, there's nobody that's Peyton. You know, there's Tom Brady and Peyton Manning and Drew Brady. Like, those guys exist in their own stratosphere of player. Um, and they're all different, but they're not replicable. You can't replicate Peyton Manning. I, I didn't go to Detroit and try to get Matthew Stafford in his ninth year to be Peyton Manning. He's Matthew Stafford. He does things his way. And I learned that quickly as you deal with different players that they're all going to be who they are. Um, and you try to impart some lessons and some things that might have worked for somebody uh, in a, you know, what worked for Peyton didn't always work for Matthew. And what worked for Matthew didn't always work for Derek Carr. And, and that's how you learn how to cater to the player that's there. And, and you find their strengths and, and try to highlight those. Um, Joe is probably the closest, you know, in terms of just personality, um, ability to, to do the things that Peyton did. Uh, but he is also was a 21 year old, 23, 22, 23 year old rookie quarterback that had never played NFL football before. As great as he was as a college player, he had never been in that arena yet. And um, it was really fun to be a part of his development from, you know, first overall pick, Heisman Trophy winner, great player. Still hadn't played it down in the NFL. Um, and to, to be a part of his growth from that spot as a, as a rookie starting quarterback on a bad football team uh, into starting in the Super Bowl and back-to-back -back AFC Championship games and being the highest paid player in football was, was an unbelievable progression to be a part of. Um, and there was a lot that was so much different than these veteran quarterbacks because there was a lot he was learning and, and trying to figure out what worked for him and what didn't work for him. Um, and so that process... Uh, to refine what, what he wanted to be and what he wanted to look like playing quarterback was um, really fun to be a part of. Having that experience of working with so many different people in so many different organizations um, must give you a sense of maybe ease or calm walking into being responsible for an entire locker room of mm -hmm. different personalities and different abilities and different strengths and weaknesses, right? Absolutely. I, there's, there's something to be said for uh, working for a lot of different people, uh, being a lot of part, different ways of doing things. There's no uh, cookie cutter way that that equals success in the NFL. There's a lot of ways you can you can win football games, and um, being a part of a lot of different places just shows you all the ways that it can happen. Um, and for me, I've taken bits and pieces and dealing with different types of players and different places in their career. Um, I feel about as comfortable as you could feel dealing with, with any player in the locker room at any point, any stage in their career, uh, where they're at, from an undrafted rookie college free agent to you know a, a 10-time Pro Bowl player that uh, is, is the face of a franchise. I, I, I've seen all of it in between, and um, I think one of my strengths is, as a coach is I've always been able to connect with players and, 
regardless of what where they're at in their journey or in their path, I've I've been able to to connect and form great relationships and and be able to really coach effectively because of it. So um, there's a lot of benefit to being a lot of places and having experience. Uh, even though I'm you know I'm 39, I I've lived a long time in the NFL and I've seen a lot. So uh, it's like dog years, you know. It's 14 years in the NFL feels like 30. So um, I feel very prepared for it. Great teams have great cultures. Yes. Um, for you, what does a winning culture look like? What is that? That's a great question. Um, to me, the, the culture, the, the schematics is probably only about 20 or 30 percent of, of what makes a good team, and the culture is the rest of it. Um, and you want you want a, a, a guys that are mentally tough. Um, you want people that want to come to work every day. They want to be around the team. They want to be around the building. They want to play for each other. And one of the the greatest things, the most difficult things about when you look at good teams across all sports um, is a bunch of guys that, that want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, they want to be a part of that team and play their role. Uh, and the best teams that I've been on have all shared that quality. Um, the best teams that you look every year, these teams that are still playing, um, they share that quality. And when you get into these moments where the talent is equal, because you get to that point where everyone's good, um, that's the difference is, is how hard do these guys play for each other, how much they love playing football, and being in the building together. Um, and you, you want that sort of culture in your building where it's fun, it's enjoyable, guys love it, they play hard, they play for each other, they play for the city. It means something to them. Um, that's, what, that's what we hope to, hope to be here in, in Nashville. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? It could be coaching or otherwise. Oh man, <laughs> there's a lot. Um, in coaching, a very more specific to coaching advice is, um, you know, I'm trying to think of the best way to phrase it, but uh, worry worry about the job that you have and and do the best, be the best you can be, whatever your role is. Um, my dad gave me that advice early in my career because in football, you know, you you become ambitious. You want to be a coordinator, a head coach, so you're trying to find ways. How do I get there? Uh, and my dad said early on in my career, just just worry about the job that you have and be great at it. Uh, and the rest of those things take care of themselves. Um, and so I've always tried to live that way. Is, is when I was a quality control coach in Denver, I was trying to be the best at that. Um, and when I was an office coordinator here in Cincinnati, I tried to be the best at that um, and not worry about everything else that comes after that. And uh, that's really helped me, I think, be really good at my job and stay really focused on what's in the moment and what's important as opposed to thinking about what's, what could be or what should be or where I should be after that. Yeah? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. When you were offered the job as mm -hmm. head coach of the Tennessee Titans, who was your first phone call? Who'd you call? Oh, my wife. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. She was by far the first. That was the first one. Um, she was not expecting it, nor was I. I wasn't expecting it either. But that was a, that was a really cool moment um, to be able to share because she's been through all of this. And the moves and the back and forth and uh, new job here, new job here, that part, you know, I'm gone a lot. I work a lot. She's got the kids all the time. And so for her to be able to share some of that joy was, was a pretty awesome moment. And then obviously right after that, I called my parents and those are my first two phone calls when I, after I got the job is the, the most important people to me are my, my family and uh, my mom and dad. So what was your dad's response? He's proud. He's proud. He's excited. Um, you know, it's. I, I was talking in the car. Uh, I don't know how many fathers and sons have been head coaches in the NFL. I know it's not a long list, um, and so that's a that's very that's a very prideful thing for for him and I um, to be a part of. And yeah, he was he was ecstatic. He, he was just, you know, it's one of those things as a dad. As I have my own son, it's like to see your to see your your kids have success in whatever they want to do. Uh, and I chose to do coaching, and I think there's something about that that uh, he has a lot of pride in, and, and really cool moment to see me be the head coach of the Tennessee Titans. You mentioned that you have kids, you do. Um, what's it like being able to share this with them and being able to bring them yeah. along for what is about, bound to be a crazy ride? Yeah, you know they they don't quite get it. They don't really. They don't think they understand like the the gravity of. You know, my dad's a head coach, and there's only one of 
he's one of 32 in, in the world that's, that's in these positions. And so they don't get that part. Um, they just think it's cool that they see dad on TV sometimes when I'm, when I'm up in the box, they get to see, they, they try to see me on TV and they get their kid, their friends talk about it at school, but they don't really, they don't understand the, the weight of, of what this is and how much this means and, um, how much of a career pinnacle this is for me. Uh, someday they will, but right now they don't quite understand and they, they enjoy it. They it's, there's a lot of commotion to it, but, uh, they're not quite old enough to really understand the whole, the whole process yet. But it's gotta be cool to be able to bring them to games and have yes. them maybe get a little bit more involved in the game as mm-hmm. Ronan, a football fan. He's getting there. He's, yeah. he's at six. He's starting to kind of be more interested. And I, I've always felt like that peaks at around like nine or 10 or 11 where like boys are just dialed into sports and they, they know all the players. And so he's starting to learn players. Um, this year, he kind of got to, he's, he would start asking about Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase and the guys that he'd watch on TV and they talk about at school. Uh, and he likes being around. Uh, and I like having him. They love coming to the office. They love being on the practice fields and they love coming to training camp. And so um, I want them around as much as possible. That's how I grew up. Um, and to have them be a part of that is, is really cool because that's how I spend my time with them too. Other than Super Bowls, mm-hmm. how do you measure your success as a head coach? Oh, you know, I, I think, you know, we're always going to be judged on, on wins and losses ultimately. Um, but do we have a team uh, of peop- of guys, like I said, that, that want to play for each other, that when we go out on Sundays, you know, that they put a product in the field that people are proud of, that they're excited to watch, um, that the city of Nashville can rally around and, and really have a lot of pride in what's occurring. Um, Usually that means you're, you're playing well enough to win games, but sometimes you, you still play well and lose. But I, I do think if you have a team of, of high character guys uh, that really love playing football, that the city identifies with, that to me is, is, is a success. On a more personal level, it's forming great relationships with the players, um, you know, making sure those guys are, are developing as a whole person. They're still really young. Um, most of those guys are, are, you know, in their early 20s. And so to be there for them, to form those relationships where I can help them grow and develop it as people is another part of it too. So um, I do wish we were judged on more of those things, but we're not. Um, but I think that's the mark of, of, a, of a good coach and a good team is a, is a bunch of guys that, that have great character, that love playing together. And there's a, there's a product in the field that um, the city and state can be proud of. What are your interests outside of football? I, you don't have a ton of free time. No, no, I don't. And, and outside of the my free time is usually spent with my kids and, and, and my wife. But um, I like to play golf a little bit. That's that's about my my relaxation hobby. Um, I, I, I've played ice hockey my whole life, so I love watching ice hockey games. Uh, I'm excited to go see the Predators play. Uh, but I've, I've always been in, in a – ice hockey is like my second love. Um, and so I, I grew up playing it. I've, I've played all the way through college, and um, I love watching it. So that's that's kind of my other thing I like to to to, to go watch and do. Um, I watch a lot of F1 racing. I don't know a lot about it, but I enjoy it. Um, other than that, though, it's it's really you're going to find me in the office uh, at the complex with with the with the people in the building, or I'm going to probably be at home with my my kids and out doing stuff with them. You excited to come to Nashville? I can't. It's kind of happening city. I can't wait. I can't wait. It's uh, it, it's got a it's got a great it's got a great energy to it, and you could feel the energy when you walk there. I felt the energy getting into the city. Um, I felt the energy in the building, and I feel that there's there's just something about Nashville that um, appealed to me. It it felt like it fit me, um, and and what a what an unbelievable unbelievable city to be a part of and, and hopefully we can win a lot of games and have a lot of fun doing it are you ready to get started uh i was ready it's right here i'm ready trust me i've been i've been on the phone a bunch and i'm ready to get get start, get settled get started and 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 hit the ground running here and, and build us a build us a, a really good football team and uh, can't wait to get you know ran's been great i love working with ran and um to build that together is going to be something really really cool uh, it's um i can't wait to get started well that was something also gives me a chance to mention that SeatGeek is now the official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans. Whether you're buying or selling tickets to Titans games or any live event in Nashville, SeatGeek is the place to do it. SeatGeek, the new official ticketing partner of the Tennessee Titans, so Titans fans can fan. It was really good. I went away and you took my line. I'm sorry. But I, okay. I was thinking about I was I wanted to make sure I complimented <laughs> you. Oh, thanks, Mike. Um, 
And, and you clearly weren't nervous. I was nervous when I interviewed him the next day. Were you? Oh, yeah. You didn't seem nervous. I was nervous. You're a professional. No. I I, I didn't have anything. Usually I have the, you know, the, the handy-dandy clipboard mm-hmm. with my questions mm-hmm. uh, or at least just some topics or whatever. Thoughts. But I, I decided to go into it because he had just done the press conference when I sat down with him. And um, – I just said, I want to see where it goes. You know, I and I told Ashley Farrell this. I was very thankful that I was the very first person who was doing an interview with him after he had got this job because there was no question that he had been asked 30 times. Right. There like, was na- no, like now he has been. Yeah. I mean, now there's six or seven questions that he has been asked 300 different ways. Which people should do. That's their job. Yeah. yeah. And, th- and that's how it goes. And that's how, what happens with everyone. But in preparing for this interview, I didn't have to be like, well, I want to stay away from this because he's talked about it a lot. I got to just is go. Th- it, that, the pad that you're holding right here on the set, is that are those the questions? This is it. Yeah, I have. Um, what, what do you think your you know, people have just heard it, but what do you think your best question was? What were the quest? What was the question oh, you gosh. liked the best? Well, there were a couple that he said that's a great question. Don't you love it when people say that? I love it. Oh man, there's no better feeling in the world <laughs> than when someone says that's a great question, unless they're being a jerk about it. Which unless they're sometimes being condescending. They do. Yeah, but I think he was being. I think it was like a genuine, like he was like, "Oh, that's a that's a great question. Let me think about it." And so, like, those were my favorite ones because then you're like, "Yes, hit it." You get a little like. Oh, what is it? Endorphins? You get a little pop yes. of something good. Yes. Yeah. So um, those were my favorite questions. But, I, I mean, just being able to talk to him about um, his, kind of his journey and the people that he's worked with. He loves to talk about the quarterbacks that he has worked with. It's pretty remarkable. And when you talk to him about uh, just – Guys that he has formed relationships with and guys that he's worked with, the Peyton Mannings, the Matthew Staffords, the, I mean, uh, Joe Burrow, all of them, he gets so, like, excited. Yeah. To, it's like bragging on his kids, you know? He's just excited to talk about it. And I thought that that was so interesting because sometimes people get annoyed by the, like, oh, yeah, they're going to ask me about the time I worked with Peyton Manning. But he genuinely is excited to talk about those things. And Peyton Manning was excited to talk about him. Which is also so cool. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Called from the golf course. Yeah, yeah. To give us quotes. Which, I mean... Had an eight iron in his hand. uh, Well, of course. but He he really did. That's what he said on the phone. I mean, what does that say about Brian Callahan that Peyton Manning would stop golfing to call and give quotes. Yeah, that's pretty great. I mean, you want to talk about a resounding recommendation right there. I have a feeling Peyton Manning's going to be here a few times. Oh, yeah? Well, yeah, because Brian Callahan's the head coach now. So you don't think he shows up at training camp or something? Well, I don't know. You talk to him more than I do. I don't talk to him. <laughs> but I'm just saying, I bet, he, I bet he does. I think you're probably right. So tell the OT people what the flight so you, you drop off the rental car. Yes. It was a one-way rental car. It was a van, right? It sure was. We took the minivan from Nashville to Cincinnati. It was just luxury the, all the way. The old minivan. Mm-hmm. And then we drop it off at the rental place. This is on Thursday morning. Drop it off at the rental car place. Um, planes, trains, and automobiles to get from the rental car place to where we needed to be at the airport. And um, You're getting to fly the owner's plane. We flew in the owner's plane which is pretty delightful accommodations. Do you get, like, juice? Well, there was coffee. Coffee. Yeah, I mean. Danish? There there was no Danish. There were snacks. Um, There were lots of snacks, which the kids really enjoyed. Um, At that point, all I needed was caffeine. Okay. That's that's really what we were looking for. Um, But, uh, I mean, flying on the owner's plane does not suck. It's pretty great. Um, and what's the conversation like? I mean, I, I don't want you to tell every story because I mean, you don't want to give it all away. But what's it what's it like talking to the well, to the head coach and his wife? As I mean, he's going to become the head coach, and you and Ashley and Todd and Donald are there with him. Yeah, there was a little bit of the so how much sleep did you get? Not a ton conversation, you know. Um, he spent a little time kind of working on the. Remarks that he was going to make at the press conference um, definitely took some time to, like, just kind of 
take it all in. Um, especially when we were driving from once we landed in Nashville, when we were driving to the stadium or when we were driving to Ascension St. Thomas sports park, we drove past the stadium. And so that was kind of a moment. And there were just little moments where like he realized that this was really it's happening. Real. Um, but then you're also having conversations about, so what neighborhood should we look for a house in? Where's the schools? What's traffic like? Any good restaurants around there? Like, there are also these conversations that are happening. Now, but to back up to Wednesday night, he sent you guys to a good restaurant. Brian, he did. Brian Callahan sent you to his favorite restaurant in Cincinnati. He did. It's a burger joint. It was really good. Um, I don't remember what it was called. That's okay. But I guess we don't work for no. the, they don't, they the don't burger give us place anything. in Cincinnati. No. Yeah, they are getting free pub from us. That's it. Um, but sent us there. It was really good food. Um, just a cool place to hang out. And um, they put on their social media that they were going to miss the Callahan family when he got the job because they are pretty consistent regulars there. That's great. <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, knew the cool places in town to send us, knew the places to, oh, yeah, you might want to try and get this try this place if you like Italian food there's that if you want to do this and that these are the places to hang out so I mean he's definitely someone who's plugged in the into the community there and wasn't gatekeeping his favorite restaurants like oh no go try this place so I am excited now for them to be here in Nashville and hopefully we can return the favor and I know that this community is going to love this family and I thought that was one of the most special parts of Thursday was just the whole family mm mm-hmm. I guess it's because my kids are grown. Yeah. But to see the little ones again, and the, they were literally hiding in the cabinets in his office and jumping out at people. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ronan was up and down the halls. and They, uh, uh, they, they are had a, at home. They there. had a big time. They had a big time. But that's how it sh- I mean, you think about it because you think about Nora and Ronan and wherever they go and whatever they do. I mean, these memories will be some, because they're old enough that they will remember all of this. Well, but and the thing that strikes me is that Coach Callahan is a coach's kid. Right. And so for him to be able to have these moments now with his kids, yeah. it's important and it's special to him to make sure that they're incorporated in this because he was incorporated with his mm-hmm. dad. And so passing that along, making sure that that's a priority, he understands the family piece of it. He knows the things that they'll remember from these like moments and from the spaces that they're able to be in. And I, I, you realize you have moments where you realize how crazy this business is and what a big deal it is to be able to do what it is you do. He mentioned a couple times that there's only 32 people in the world who do this job and he's now one of them. Um, and uh, having that realization always kind of strikes me because it's true. Um, and that's such a small number of people when you think about the whole world. Sure. Um, and so he wants to be able to have that experience for himself, but also pass it down to his family and make sure that they're able to have those moments as well and really enjoy what it is that he does. And I think that that's really special. And I think that his perspective on it is so unique. Pretty good for you. Oh, it was gr- I mean, I had the time of my life. Welcome back. Uh, yeah, it is. It is really really good to be back but to be back like that yeah. to get the first interview with brian callahan it's pretty good work yeah it's not a bad first week back i'm mm-hmm. um, maybe a little rusty but we'll shake that off i think it's interesting uh that he and Rand carthon are not going to the senior bowl sort of following a different trend mm-hmm. uh we're, we're starting to see fewer and fewer head coaches go to the senior bowl and I think in this case, however, it's largely about putting the staff together. Yeah, I think this is a timing thing more than anything else that uh, because of when he was hired, not that it was early or late, just how it falls on the calendar. He's got some things that he wants to take care of that feel more time sensitive. And there's enough people going down there that he trusts that he doesn't necessarily need to be boots on the ground. There are other people who can evaluate, scout, do the things that they need to do. And 
they still get another shot of a lo- shot at a lot of these guys and the combine in a couple weeks. That's right. So uh, just the timing of how things lined up, I don't think that he's anti senior bowl. I think it's just the way that everything lined up. But it, I think you're right that we're starting to see different emphasis being put in different places when it comes to some of these uh, kind of all-star bowls and some of the different scouting opportunities. And I think a lot of that has to do with just how many things are digital now or how many things are televised and just the way that things are. He said he was talking about workouts even at the combine. And he said, there's so much stuff that's on TV now. You're not seeing anything different on TV than what we're seeing in the building. You know, it's the same stuff. So that makes it a little less, not that guys aren't at the combine or anything like that, but it's not imperative that you are in your seat at a certain time in that moment because it's all recorded and it's all televised. So it's just the way that the world is. So many things are more available. Um, You don't have to physically be there for every moment of every event at every time. So just because someone physically isn't in a space doesn't mean they're not working. They're definitely working. Good angle. Thank you so much for your work. It was fun. Yeah. I'm I am just, I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about this human. I'm so glad he's leading the Titans. I'm excited to be back. For Amy Wells, I'm Mike Keith, thanking you for listening to the OTP.